So the way we started is we started looking at tuberculosis, right? Because you know the reason why we, we one should look at tuberculosis. So we built this paper fluidic device. Our goal was to build a platform for DNA amplification of paper so that you can have a quick diagnosis. So um, what? So this is not PCR. This is something called isothermal amplification. So you just need a hot plate and a single temperature and some enzymes for the DNA to amplify. But you get very a lot of DNA. Uh, so the okay, you are probably wondering why? Why do we need enzymes and how do you amplify DNA, right? In this. Hey, hi! Welcome to Biotech Talks. In this episode, we have Dr. Devjani Paul, a scientist at IIT Bombay. In her lab, she is developing devices based on microfluidic technology for healthcare applications. So affordable and accurate kits for detecting sickle cell anemia, DNA amplification on paper, and radial pillar device will be explained by Dr. Dev Jenny Paul in this episode of Biotech Talks. So I hope you enjoy. Hello, ma'am. How are you? I'm fine. It's great to meet you finally. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. So, starting with the first question, uh, what is microfluidic technology? So, microfluidics deals with fluid flow through very tiny channels. Okay, the word micro comes because these channels have the dimension of a few to a few hundreds of microns. Okay, so any one of the dimension, like width or height, and so on. So that's like the thickness of say human hair, right? So that's as narrow as this. Now, what happens is that when you go down to these kind of micro channels, the fluid flow is governed by certain phenomena, which allows us to do certain functions which you normally not be able to do in bigger channels. Okay, so there is something called laminar flow, uh, which allows you to sort of pattern cells on a surface and so on. So there are many functionalities that we get. So that's what microfluidics is all about. So. Uh, like what are the devices which uses this phenomenon? Oh, a lot. I mean, you'd be surprised to know how we um, use microfluidics around us. So, for example, your common inkjet printer, right? The printhead has a tiny nozzle which is like a very tiny chap, and then it sort of uh, gives out these picoliter sized droplets, right? So that's what is called droplet microfluidics. So that's one. You have a lot of diagnostic tests that, that are uh, uh, built around microfluidic devices. So for, uh, there are PCR machines, you've heard of PCR, yeah. right, because of COVID so much and uh, PCR machines are there that use the microfluidic technology currently in the market, they're there. So we don't really know that we are using microfluidics, but it's there. Okay. So like I was thinking like, I have heard about nanotechnology, right? Yes. When we go to that micro dimension, yes. then the property changes. Yes. Now, why, like nanotechnology is like that only. Now, when we go to nano size, then oh. some property changes. Good and question. So, in the nano dimension, the fluid physics is even more different. Okay. So, from your macro dimension to the moment you have come to micro dimension, there's one kind of fluid physics, but. Uh, and, and when you go to nano dimension, there's something else that happens. So when you have nano channels, right? Yeah. So for example, think of transporting single DNA molecules, that's tiny. So there you have to treat those channels in a slightly different way as to micro channels, which is let's say of the order of single cells. So you can see the difference between the two, right? So why physics changes as we narrow it down more and more, right? It's interesting. I don't think I've ever been asked why physics changes. I mean, one of the it's one of the things that happens is from macroscopic dimension to microscopic dimension, uh, there is a dimensionless quantity that describes the fluid flow that is called Reynolds number. You may have heard of this. So the Reynolds number in micro channels is much much less than one. So that. The fact that the viscosity becomes important, surface tension becomes important. On the other hand, things like inertial forces are very less. That's what leads to this kind of very small Reynolds number, which allows us in turn to do very interesting biology inside these cells. Can you please elaborate on the device that your lab is developing for sickle cell anemia? Right. So, what we have come up with. Uh, 
device which is not just microfluidics, it has four components. So there's some blood chemistry involved, then there is a microfluidic chip, we built a microscope and finally some image analysis. All these four tests together will not only tell you that so and so has sickle cell anemia, they will also detect sickle cell trait. So what happens, the way the test is going to work is you take a drop of blood and you mix it with two different concentrations of a chemical called sodium metabisulfite. What it does, it creates a hypoxic condition in that blood sample. And this is the hypoxic condition that if you inherit the sickle gene, your red blood cells have hemoglobin which are sickle hemoglobin. So under these conditions, they will polymerize and they will take very different shapes. So we built this microscope, we image these blood samples with these microscope and we image it inside a microfluidic chip which allows us to have a very controlled condition and makes this sickling uh, which may sometimes take several hours to within a few minutes. And then you run an image processing algorithm ideally on your phone and then you are able to tell this. Now the distinction is that what we are telling you is whether somebody has sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait who is a carrier but doesn't have the disease condition. The only way now you can detect is either by hemoglobin electrophoresis or you know high performance liquid chromatography and things like that. Whereas this is a simple microscopy test which can give you the same information and it can be done in the field. So we have tested this in various field locations in Gujarat and Maharashtra where the government runs sickle cell screening camps. So I have two questions. First is like how this microchip that you are using in this device is different than normal slide? Very good question. So the way this is different is if you put these blood samples on your normal side and you make a smear and you want to look at it, you could do that, right? Yeah. But your slide is exposed to oxygen. Okay. So that hypoxic condition will not be created. Mm -hmm. So you need to confine it some kind of an imaging chamber. Okay. What we have done is that we have varied this dimension of this imaging chamber and showed that there is a certain specific dimension where you get the best results in terms of the number of red blood cells that you have that are sickly as well as the time it takes for them to sickle. So these two things you want a trade-off, there, there's some kind of a trade-off between them. You want a, about 100 to 300 cells in the field of view when you are imaging, right? So to be sure that those cells are sickle, right? On the other hand, you don't want to wait ages for that to happen. The more uh, smaller is the chip, the longer it takes, okay? So there is a sort of a balance between the two, which is a certain dimension of the microfluidic chip that we have come up with, purely by experiments, purely by trial and error, which allows us to do this. And like, you, we, I'm not able to understand how you are able to detect the person who is carrier. Good point. <laughs> How do we do that? All very excellent questions. So, there are few things that you need to understand about this process of sickling. So, one is that yes, you have sickle hemoglobin and if there is hypoxia, cells will sickle. But, when they sickle, what kind of a cell shape will they take? Now, the, that depends on a number of factors. Now, this is here, we don't have to come up with many new science, okay? So, for since uh, 1970s and so on, there's been a lot of work on sickle hemoglobin polymerization. So, what they do, they showed that if you somehow control the speed at which this polymerization happens, then the cells take different shapes. So, if you make this polymerization happen very, very slowly, which is where you have a very low concentration of the sodium metabisulfide, then the cells become very elongated kind of shapes. If you make this polymerization happen faster, that is you have an increased concentration, then these shapes have multiple spikes, which are called holly leaf kind of shapes. So that's one factor. And the other factor is the amount of sickle hemoglobin that a cell contains. So a people who have disease, almost all of their hemoglobin is sickle hemoglobin, unless they have some other kind of condition. If they're children, then they may have uh, fetal hemoglobin up to a point, but as adults they won't have that, right? Whereas people who have the sickle cell trait condition, they have uh, sickle hemoglobin as well as normal hemoglobin. There might be other things as well, but I'm just focusing on these two. So given the amount of sickle hemoglobin is different in them, 
and the fact that we can control the speed of polymerization, these two factors allow us to have very different kind of cell shapes that you have with sickle uh, disease and sickle trained blood samples. And then we run an image processing algorithm with a little bit of machine learning which allows us to distinguish between the two. If you are just looking at it by eye, it may be difficult for you to tell. So, are there any other diseases that you are focusing on? Just I like know, I, I have been asked about this and I have been thinking about this a lot. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an answer yet. There are uh, diseases where the cell shifts change, but whether this is so specific that you can detect it, right now not so far. So, what we are currently focusing is validating our technique with a large number of samples with benchmarking with a gold standard test which is HPLC by done by a well-known path lab in their labs. Once this benchmarking is uh, completed then I will be free to focus on other problems. Can you also describe the work that your lab is doing on the radial pillar devices? Okay, that's a different kind of a device, that's a cell sorting device. So what it does is it essentially, um, am I, can I take out a model that I have? Yeah. So this is a 3D printed, a much, much bigger scale model of your radial pillar device or rapid as we call it. It's a cell sorting device. So this is a microfluidic chamber and inside that you have these kind of tiny pillars. So you was, there are these pillars, they are arranged in different layers and the gap between the pillars go on becoming very, very small. So the final layer that you are seeing here, it has a gap of about 2 microns. Whereas the ones, they are bigger. So the way this happens is, these are the <coughs> inlets and outlets. So you pump in whole blood through here. This is the area. This first set of pillars stops the red blood, uh, white blood cells. Okay. Then this is the middle layer which stops the red blood cells. And also there is an outlet here through which you can take those out. Because they are the highest number of cells in blood. right? And finally, this is the layer that so traps the that lets the platelets go through and you can collect them out of this outlet. So the way we use this, you take a small volume of blood and you can actually get platelets out of this. So this is a very small volume operation for diagnostics, not for large volume platelets. Okay. So it's working like it's doing a job of HPLC, but uh, not HPLC. I mean, uh, you know, your there are blood separation devices, right, that you have in your um, uh, pathology labs where, you know, they separate red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets and all of that. Uh, so that's what this does. But those uh, require larger volumes. So if you have, like, say, a couple of drops of blood, then you can use a device like this. That's the difference. Why, why do we separate, like, in that lab? So, for example, um, Sometimes you, you may just need to know the platelet count very quickly. So sometimes before certain blood transfusion, people need to know, right? Or you know like in dengue, people's platelet counts go down. So you need to have a quick count, right? So rather than having 4 ml of blood and then doing those counts in those machines, maybe there's a way to use this and have a small volume for that. So you are also working on some devices that help to identify microbes. Um, yes, although um, this is something um, we are, that has a lot of potential. So the way we started is we started looking at tuberculosis, right? Like, you know the reason why we, we one should look at tuberculosis. So we built this paper fluidic device. Our goal was to build a platform for DNA amplification on paper so that you can have a quick diagnosis. So uh, what? So this is not PCR. This is something called isothermal amplification. So you just need a hot plate and a single temperature and some enzymes for the DNA to amplify. But you get very a lot of DNA. Uh, so the, okay, you are probably wondering why. Why do we need enzymes and how do you amplify DNA, right, in this? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. But I'm just wondering that it is, it, I, can, I am able to imagine it in a, an aqueous solution. On yes. a plate, I am not... Uh... No, so in an aqua solution, you of course, you can do it in a tube, right? What you do is you take a piece of paper. Of course, this paper is slightly different to the paper you write on. This is filter paper, let's say. And you spot uh, your chemicals all in it. And you 
dry it and you keep it like that that's ready when you want to do something add your sample here add the whole cells um, e coli mycobacteria whatever you have and then you with all of that you put it on a hot plate for a certain amount of time so it splits the cells open it brings out the dna it does the isothermal amplification and then you detect so what we currently do is we look at uh, look at it we add a fluorescent dye to it and look at it under the microscope to see how how much dna has been amplified ideally we would even want to eliminate the microscope and have a visual marker but that's not something we have done yet if you can do this then there will be applications of it now so like you are replacing pcr machine no? the function of pcr machine is to like give temperature like at 90 yes. degrees that's degree. the same job yeah. can be done by enzymes so helicases can split open yeah. double stranded dna instead and of 95 degrees that hot plate is giving temperature to About separate dna 90 degrees that's that's where your enzymes are most active okay. so the temperature is decided by the enzymes functionalities yeah. so that single temperature they this this commercial kits the way they have designed that your helicase your uh, um, the polymerase etc all of that are active at that particular temperature so that's typically around 60 65 degrees yeah. so and uh, and that's it what we even done is we can show that you can lyse cells including mycobacterium tuberculosis cells just at 65 degrees if you just wait long enough so it is applied anyway not yet. not yet not yet because we need to figure out detection and secondly all this is done with cultured cells you need to show something with real samples if that works then we'll think of applications i know that a lot of company i am invested in lot to make those small pcr devices yes. and this will change it let's see we are yeah. still working oh. on this so Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.